Hall of Fame broadcaster Marty Brenneman here, and he's the best storyteller in the game, and it's time to sit back, relax, and have some laughs. Welcome to the Mayor's Office, and here's your host, Sean Casey. Man, we're back at it, Chidge. We Woo-hoo-hoo. are, and you have a guest in your house, Sean, and if this interview is anything like the conversations you guys just had in the 20 minutes when we were setting up our audience is in for a doozy today. <laughs> oh, this is going to be a doozy, man. This is going to be a doozy. This is a great friend of mine and uh, local resident too. But let's let's get into it really quick. Ten years in the big leagues, uh, uh, in second in the Cy Young Award, I believe in '72, MVP voting that year too. All Star in '72, '71, still only the only pitcher, NL pitcher, to throw a game seven complete game. Still to this day. 71 World Series champions with the Buccos, has been a Pirate legend. Seriously. Sure. For like 60 years, he's been with the Pirates, which that's a whole other story. Blast again in that. Let's just bring him in because I got so many accolades. Let's go. Here for a freaking hour talking about Steve Blast, my man. Blast. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man, just like I wrote it. <laughs> just like you wrote it. And, and the guy's been living in Upper St. Clair. We live in the same town for like 42 years. And he's calling me. He's like, First off, he doesn't have Waze or MapQuest. He's like, Case, where are you here? And I was like, where do I go? I'm like, Blast, didn't you live here for 42 years? <laughs> I said, yeah, I'm only six miles out of Lincoln, Nebraska. you got to walk me in. <laughs> so good, man. Yeah, so, Blast, how's everything going, man? Like, uh, what, what, what are you doing? How's retirement I'm, for you? I'm mostly retired, but I'm doing some amb- uh, ambassadorial work for the Pirates. So, yeah. I get out and do that. And uh, so, that keeps my hand in a little bit. But yeah. uh, after 60 years... Uh, uh, backed it off, and uh, you can tell uh, that I played before free agency because I never had a house like this. <laughs> I did not have a house like this. So, but it was a nice house. It was good. They're nice people, but uh, damn, well, I, I, what I, I even made the wall back here. <laughs> It's in well, the back, it's yeah, in the back part right. of the wall. The back. <laughs> yeah. we, got a, we got a whole thing over here with the Pirate Legends and Blast is on my wall. Uh, Dino Garino <laughs> yeah. at Dick Perrine. Dick yep. Perrine had a, um, God rest his soul, had a, yeah, yeah. Had, a, had, a, had a barrage. So, and he threw me in there, too. I was only playing for the Buccos for four months. I'm not really a legend. It's you. Yeah, yeah the Josh copy Gish- I had doesn't have your picture. Right? <laughs> well, it has your name down below. My no, name no below. picture. <laughs> Oh my but, God, uh, dude! I, I don't even know. There's so many awesome places to go, Blast, because you're one of the best storytellers this game's probably ever seen, um, and one of the best personalities too. But uh, I want to go back. I just want to go back to where it all started. You know, Steve Blast getting into the game, high school. Yeah. Uh, you know, can you take us take us back to your yeah, days? Yeah, from really? a small town in Connecticut, uh, yeah. about 800 people. Uh, actually, three of us came out of that little high school to play in the big leagues. But we'll get to that. But. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, my wife, Karen, had a couple brothers. That, uh, the, uh, two of them signed with the Pirates. The guy, the brother that was ahead of me, I had to root for him to graduate because he was so good, I didn't get to be the top guy in high school until he graduated. And then I threw five no-hitters my senior year. So, <laughs> But the point was that the scouts were around this little high school because my wife, Karen's uh, cousin, Tom Parsons, pitched for the Pirates in the big leagues and the Mets. What? And then... Uh, the the next brother that was ahead of me signed with the Pirates and he blew his arm out. And then I signed. And then later on, the other brother signed and came to the big league. So at one time, my wife's brother, my brother-in-law, and I were teammates with the Pirates in the early 70s. Wow. So it was a, a great... Was he look. like, you better be taking care of Karen, but I have somebody to kick your ass. <laughs> yeah, he was, he, he was assigned by mom and dad to watch me. <laughs> <laughs> he was on. So it was it was a great kind of a scenario because uh, they were aware of this little high school right. producing really good good players. And we had a great great one of those great coaches. Uh, so uh, I signed, and I had never been out of Falls Village, Connecticut, population eight hundred. So when I came to Pittsburgh to try out, we flew out of Bradley Field in Hartford, yeah. and we took off, and the plane banked to the left, and I leaned to the right so I could help balance. <laughs> Being a, a little naive as a country boy, so I go to Kingsport, Tennessee, uh, not having been anywhere. Wow! And we get there, so it was one of those things. It was the rookie league, so we all stayed in this one rooming house. And you'd wake up, and two guys would be gone, and then that night, two more would be signed. So right. yeah, one of those deals. And I had never been away from home, so after a couple of weeks, I started to smell bad. So I had to go to a laundromat. <laughs> Never been to a laundromat. Mom always did my clothes. So I go down to the laundromat. I got like six pair of underwear, six pair of socks. 
I throw them in there, and I see this little, like, vending machine up on the wall. It said soap. So I said, all right, I've got 12 items. I'm going to get 12 boxes. <laughs> I put 12 boxes of those little soaps in, and, and about 30 seconds later, the stuff starts coming out of the machine. I ran away. At 18 years old, I ran away from the laundromat. That's how naive I was. <laughs> oh my God. And truth be known, this is one of the few stories I t- say is true. I, for the rest of the summer, had a little box of straps around. I would mail my laundry back to home. My mother would do it, mail it back to me, until in the middle of August, I sent them home. She washed them, but she enclosed some chocolate chip cookies she had cooked oh, in no. the middle of August. And it looked like somebody did a bad thing in that box <laughs> so of clothes. So a big bomb so, in your... <laughs> yeah, so, so I learned how to do the laundromat after oh that. Oh, my gosh. But, uh, you know, the, the minor league... They're, they're, back then, this is 1960, so yeah. rustic, you know, and so antiquated when we look back now. But you know what? I was making two fifty a month. I was living my dream. And 19, 18-year-old kids, we're so happy yeah. you know you know how it is to oh, sign you're dreamed about it Watertown, since you're New York, yes. yeah, you, you dream about it because i was in batavia yeah so, yeah so so was that the new york penalty yeah nyp yeah, yeah. i played in new york penalty too. yeah pitched against uh, uh, mel stottlemyre he was in auburn and you know yes. uh, all the guys uh, for for the reds were down in geneva yeah so anyway uh, who was on the reds at, that, at those times i, I think tony Myers. was there tony, i think yeah, Rose, yeah was in that area where rose yes. and perez yes. and those are, they were oh, loaded man. our system was loaded wow so uh you come up through and, and uh, uh, just uh, it was it was a, a life you dreamed about when you're eight years old. Who, Play pro ball. Oh, uh, dude! I remember being in Watertown, New York, and I remember the first pitching change happened. It was like sixth inning. You know, here comes Joel Skinner, our manager, comes yeah. out to take out. And I remember this guy Mark Deshaines comes out. He's a short. We're on the mound, and I remember looking around. I just signed. And I'm like, Indians on my chest. I'm like, Can you believe we're playing pro ball, man? Can you that? believe we're in pro ball? Like that feeling of like. We've made it. Yeah. You know, we've made it. Yeah. And I, I went my first full year was, was Batavia. And uh, we had Gene Baker, who had played the year before with the Pirates in the World Series. Right. The first black manager in organized baseball, in the real structured baseball, wow. Gene Baker. Wow. And uh, he, he came in to, uh, to, to coach at Batavia. So it's just, just a, a joy. And then yeah. uh, I have to tell you, I got the call. Yeah. I got, you know, because all of us remember getting the call. The yes. Oh, so, yeah. I'm in Columbus, Ohio. Yeah. Karen and I had just been married one year. And so we go on a road trip to Buffalo, Rochester, and Syracuse, the northern tier. And we're on a bus, you know, 14-day trip when we're all kids. And we, we smell like billy goats by the end. <laughs> so the last day of the trip, we're playing a night doubleheader with Syracuse. Right. And I'm pitching the second game. So we've been on the road these 14 days, living on a bus, basically. I pitch that game. We shower, get back on the bus, drive all the way from... Syracuse, back to Columbus. Okay, I go right to bed in our little apartment. I'm, I'm beat and crushed from the trip and game. The phone rings at 10 o'clock in the morning. Right. Karen says, hello. And this gentleman says, uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to talk to Steve. And she says, well, I'm sorry. He's sleeping and, you know, he, uh, he, I'm not going to wake him up. He's a very, very long night. I really need to talk to Steve. <laughs> and she says, listen, mister, my husband is a professional athlete. He's had a very difficult trip. He's been all over the place for 14. And now he's, he needs this rest. I'm not going to wake him up. He said, young lady, my name is Joe L. Brown. I'm the general manager of the Pittsburgh Pirates, and we'd like to have Steve come up and pitch for us. The next thing you heard in that little apartment was, get your ass out of bed. We're going to the big leagues. <laughs> <laughs> and, that's, and that's how I got the call. Oh, and my I, gosh. Oh, that's yeah. so great. So, that is we so... all remember the call. Oh, the yeah. call. Yeah. The call. We, 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 we always, we've talked to a lot of guys in the show about the call because it's, it's one moment in your life you'll never, ever, ever forget. You dreamed about it since you are eight years old. So yeah. we get to Pittsburgh. And we stay at the Webster Hall Hotel, the old hotel near to Forbes Field. It's, it's raining, and I walk across the, the Pitt campus over to Forbes Field, walk in the clubhouse, and you know, the clubby, John Hallahan, Hooley, we call him. Right. He's seen this rookies for years. And I'm in there, I'm looking around. There's Clemente's locker, and Maz, and Stargell's locker, and my eyes are this big. And I look over, and I see a little Iron City tag yeah. above, and it had my name on it. And I was just looking in there. Raining cats and dogs, and Hooley says, uh, "Aren't you going to put one on and put one of these uniforms on him?" And uh, well, I said, "It's raining out there." He said, "Kid, take a study of that locker." He says, "You know that uh, if, if you get rained on, there's another locker or another uniform just like it." 
that's one of the reasons they call it the big leagues. <laughs> oh, that's so great. That, that was my first oh, day in the clubhouse. So. And they do your laundry for you in the big leagues, too. No laundromat. No, no soap boxes <laughs> up there. Yeah. No running away. No running away. <laughs> no running away. So. so good. But to join that crowd. So on this group, you know, you, sometimes you hear about playing tricks on rookies and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. These guys, the Law, Friend, Bob Friend, Vernon yes. Law, Maz, Stargell, wow. uh, Dick Gro, Larry, uh, Jerry Lynch, all these guys, they helped me go from being a ball player to a major leaguer, a and leader. there's a big difference. Yeah. You know, they talk to me about responsibilities as a big leader to your city, to your organization, to your teammates, uh, how to handle the media, what get involved with charity work, be a be a part of all that. A lot of ball players, not too many big leaguers, yeah. but those guys. I'll never forget how they helped me go from being a ball player to a major leaguer, and that yeah. that stuff. And you recall yeah. people who. Gave you that, and you try to pass it on. Pass it on, All, exactly. all the way down, all the way down. I think that's why this game's great, because I it, had, it had the same guys, the Pete Harnesses, the Barry Larkins. The, Absolutely. The yeah. guys that were like, hey, man, this is how you got to handle yourself, carry yourself. Hey, pick up the clubhouse dues. You know, for the guys will pick up your clubhouse dues, or then they pay for the meals, and you pay that You pay that forward. I had Jerry Lynch was around for a long time, and I don't know, I was a kid, you know, rookie. I was in the clubhouse during BP one time. I didn't yeah. practice. He came in there and called me and said, if I ever see you in the clubhouse when your teammates are on the field, I'm going to kick your ass. <laughs> Life lesson. Life, Life lesson. lesson. Which, which makes a lot of sense. When your team's on the field, you should be out you there. You should be out yeah, there. Yeah, there's exactly. no reason you should be in the clubhouse. So yeah. uh, it's, uh, it, it's one of those things. If you listen, Maz, who doesn't say, Bill Maserati doesn't say anything, but when he talks, you listen. Uh, you know, I said, you know, the name on the front of your uniform is a lot more important than the name on the back. Wow. You know, that kind of stuff. And, uh, he, yeah. he he was so great, but he also had a sense of humor yeah. as, as a rookie. So <laughs> Maz was one of these guys that, that absolutely paid attention to his position, respected what everybody else did. So he never walked around giving advice to outfielders or pitchers or anything. Right. He took care of second base, right. expected you to take care of that. But the one thing he hated was when one of our pitchers would be out there getting getting beat up. And, and the manager would say, well, they got somebody warming up in the bullpen. Go kill some time. Go right. over and talk to the pitcher. He hated that because right. he respected the pitcher. Right. And so one night, I'm out there, and I'm getting my face ripped off. I mean, this is like back when they had the oil embargoes. I mean, my ERA is going up <laughs> faster than the price of gas. <laughs> and I'm getting killed. And so Danny Murtaugh looks out at Maz and said, you know, go over and talk to us so, so we can get somebody ready here. Right, right, right. He ain't going to last long. <laughs> so Maz comes over like, this is Maz. You know, I don't want to be here. This is not my idea, but they made me do this. But you know what? You are getting your ass kicked. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Appreciate that. But, uh, but I, I, I learned so much from him. You know, watching him, you didn't have to, you didn't have to, hear much because he didn't talk much but watching him go around about his business as a as a professional he also told me my rookie year he said you know kid you're in the big leagues now no more excuses this is the big leagues people don't care about why you didn't they want to know why you did they don't care oh, wow. so no excuses no excuse and that that stayed with me the rest of my career i get beat up yeah you stand up in front of the, the media when they come in after and you talk to them you you respect them for their jobs and that's that's the way it is. You carry yourself as good as you are when you're doing well. Same way, carry yourself the same. Be a professional. This is the big leagues. Right. It doesn't get any better. Right. Or more. So you learn that stuff. Yes. Clemente, you know, yeah. watching him, he had a presence. Yeah. You know, what, what, he, when, when you first came up, what no. was he like? What was he like to you? He was on a pedestal. Yeah. For every young pirate that ever came during that time, he was on a pedestal. And. You, you want the way he the way he dressed, the way he presented himself to the media. One thing I learned about him, watching him in the clubhouse, he had more time and more awareness with somebody who was frightened, intimidated about being there. Like if a kid came in from a high school, or somebody had just started being a sports, he had a sense of their uneasiness, and he would embrace that. He had time for the national guys too. But he had this sense of somebody who's struggling or was scared or intimidated, he went over and sought them out. But my favorite story about him when I was my rookie year, uh, I came in one time and there was not too many guys around. I came in early. He was over by his locker. So I, 
well, I'm going to get, I'll, I'll get him squared away. I just won, <laughs> I just won two games in a row. One of them was a shutout. So I went over his locker and said, "Hey, Robbie, uh, just let me tell you one thing. Here's how it's going to be. If I ever get traded, I'm going to pitch you inside because every National League pitcher pitches you away, and you hit 350 every year." I said, "Blast! I'm going to tell you one thing. You pitch me inside, I will hit the ball to Harrisburg." <laughs> And I said, good talk, good talk. And I slunk back over my locker and kept my mouth shut for the next month. <laughs> and, so and we laughed great. about it later. But boy, oh it, 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> so okay, great. yeah, good talk. <laughs> and then, of course, you know how it is with every pitcher uh, thinks they can hit and yeah. every player thinks they can they pitch. Can pitch yeah. Every once in a while, Clemente would be out there getting loose. He said, Blast, come over here and watch this breaking ball. <laughs> and he'd throw this piece of shit. <laughs> Up there, that, that looked like a dead mackerel. And I said, Robbie, keep your day job. Yeah, you're doing fun. It's going to work out for you. But, uh, oh, what was it about Clemente? He had a presence. He, yeah. The way he carried himself. Yeah. Uh, he had principles that were never compromised. I mean, you know, to be a major leaguer, you got to be good. And you, you've got to know how to carry yourself. But he was at a different level. You know, you, you could watch him. He had a presence kneeling in the on-deck circle. Right. I've got a picture of him up on my wall that he's just kneeling there and, there, and there's a dignity, there's a presence, and it, it never it never changed. It never, the way he dressed, the way he was on the road. I mean, he walk into a clubhouse, most of the time he's wearing a, a dressy outfit, might be a suit up many times. And here's a guy after we won the World Series that uh, some local folks, I won't mention who it was, because it doesn't matter, they offered him a nice deal, an endorsement, a commercial. Right. And he said, I, I would like to include my, some of my t- three or four of my teammates. And they said, no, it's got to be you. So he turned them down. Oh, wow. And, you know, nobody was making much money back then. I right. think Clemente made 130 grand one year. Wow. Which, you know, back in the, back oh, in the day was good money. Decent money, yeah. Very good money. Uh, but just, just to watch him uh, uh, and, and the honor of spending 10 years on the field with him. Wow, man. And in his presence, learning about how to handle yourself. Um, and how about this? I got Clemente in right field. I got Maz in second base. I got Stargell first. I got three Hall of Famers. Oh I said, just hit the ball in that direction. That's how I look it. I'm going to go get a sandwich. When I come back, you'll be out. So, so don't, don't get all stressed out about it. Oh my God. But I look around. There's Maz, Clemente, and Stargell. <laughs> how good is that? Yeah. To grow up in that atmosphere... And then the the pirate, yeah, that's like just like legend. It's royalty. It's royalty. That's it, it, like it, baseball royalty. Royalty yeah. Cooperstown. And right at that time, we had a farm system that was loaded. So I came up in '64, and toward the end of the '60s, now you got in the minor leagues. You got Manny Sanguin. You got Richie Hebner. You got you got Gene Alley. Uh, you got Bob Robertson. You got Hebner. You got Oliver. Oliver. So now that they're all meshing with that that group, you know. The, and that was the time we had all, almost equal parts shown of black, white, and Latino. Right. And how about the figureheads, Maz, Stargell, and Clemente? And that wave of minor league talent come together. And that's why the pirate team of the 70s became so good. And uh, oh. it was just, it was a great time yeah. to be a pirate. And you know, this, this town of Pittsburgh is such a good, good baseball yeah. town. And it's like other cities, you've got to have a winner. Yeah. But they but love boy, baseball. You, you, you were there in the golden eras in, of the Pirates. In the wheelhouse. And, yes. Yeah. And a word about this, this city, too, as coming from a small town and how they embraced our family. And, you, 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 you know, you keep track of that stuff. And so you never forget that. So the people you see at the, at the Giant Eagle or, or the yeah. grocery store, the restaurant, the gas station, uh, it, it's, the, the city is, is small, but it's manageable. And it's got all the amenities you want in a city. I, I, I couldn't have dreamed. So my loyalty, when I go back to starting with the Pirates, you know, my buddies just said, well, you know, it could have been the Yankees or the Mets or Philly, something. Who, you could have been drafted by anybody. There wasn't any draft. You could have been signed by anybody. Right. I said, yeah, you're right, but it was the Pirates. And so they have my loyalty forever because it's the Pirates that gave me that opportunity. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I'll never quit on them. You know, yeah. it's, just, it's just the way it is. It's how you're bought up a little bit. Yep. But it's the way you received and the way the people here made me feel yeah. and our family feel. And uh, you just, if you're bought up right, you don't lose track of that That's stuff. Tr- yeah. I, I always Case. Hear, oh, you know, I'm sorry. 
Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, and this is for you too, because being an outsider living outside of Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh is such a rootable town, meaning like for me living in another place, like Pittsburgh seems, it's just, it's a working class people. So you, everybody outside of Pittsburgh roots for the Steelers when they're good and roots for Pittsburgh when they're good, because it just seems like that community is so, is so important. Real. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. This town, this town is real. You go, don't get a lot of bull crap, yeah. you know, and people are pretty legit because they're working their tails off, yeah. and it has that history, that background of the steel town. These, these are, are, are hard-working, real people, and, and that becomes a cliche at times, yeah. but it happens to be accurate, yeah. and accurate things become cliches. It's tr- My dad used to tell me that all the time, like, hey, listen, this is the city. This is this. We, we, we're, we love being part of the city because this is good blue-collar workers. Yeah. These guys, you know, they earn their paycheck. They got their lunch bells every day. And, that, and that's the truth, you know, yeah. and I... Yeah, and dads dads have that gift of telling you, you know, if you're not afraid to work, you'll always eat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And <laughs> so we were lucky enough to, to play this silly game and, yeah, and play yeah. it well enough and, and, uh, and, and go from there. But there's platforms that occur before you play big league baseball or you go on to be a movie star, you know, whatever, yeah. wherever you... But if you've got that foundation... Yeah. Then you you stay aware of that, and and uh, you know, it it makes life a little more real. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's funny because you know your 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 heroes. Uh, people say, "Hey, you're your baseball player, your hero," but you know when it comes down to it, and I know you feel this way because I know you well enough, and I feel it. We can have heroes too: the people who teach, the people who heal, yes. and the people who give them themselves and their resources and their time to help other people. You're not going to go too far wrong if you're brought up that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's so true. It, no. it can fit, and, the, it and that stuff stays with you. Yeah, no, there's no yeah. doubt. There's no. That's why you know when you talk about the the the, the virtues and the and the, the men that Clemente and Stargell yeah. and Maz were. Yeah. When you come up, man, they're, 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 these are those kind of guys. Yeah. These are these are hard work and blue blue collar, you know, yeah. Pittsburgh kind of guys. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? I want to go back to the minor leagues for a second. Yeah. We had a conversation before we got started. On Stargell, right? Did you oh. you came up with Pop Stargell? Yeah, we came and through the minor leagues. So, what was that like, especially for for the for the black guys yeah. back in the minor leagues? Yeah. For guys like Stargell in the '60s, and you know, was it really as it, bad as they say it, it was? It was it was it was starting to get better. Yeah, but it was still there was still a lot of stuff going on. There was a lot of stuff going on, and Willie came up through the minor leagues, uh, and it didn't destroy him. But he wasn't treating, uh, he wasn't respected all the, all the time, and, and a lot of the other guys, not just Willie Stargell. We were in the minors, so the minor league camps uh, that we went to after we went, you know, got sent down from the, the major league camp. We were in Daytona Beach, in Jacksonville Beach. We were in Jacksonville uh, in the minor leagues, like the, I think 61 and, and 60 and 62. Wow. So we're in Jacksonville, and we ate a common breakfast at a, at a restaurant that the pirates, because we didn't have any money, so we had a bus that would pick us up to take us to this restaurant for breakfast. And the bus would go to the white part of town, pick us up, and then go to the black section of town, pick up those guys, the Latinos and the black guys, uh, Willie Stargell included, and then we'd go to a common breakfast. And that was as, as recent as the 60s. Wow. So they had to go through that. When we came to uh, Bradenton, Florida, and we a lot of us stayed out on Anna Marie Island. Oh, yeah. It was very difficult for the black players to get places out on Anna Marie Island in, in the late 60s. Wow. That was 1969. Uh, so uh, I, I was aware of that. And uh, you know, going through the assassination of Martin Luther King, going, going back to 60, 68 or 69, yeah. I should know that. The, but going north during that spring training when that happened, we had exhibition games in Washington, D.C. and Richmond, and we had a, a team meeting. Maury Wills, Willie Stargell, Clemente, all got up, and we all agreed. It, it was unanimous. We would not play uh, the next day or the next couple of days because of, of that happening. So this pirate wow. team in that era, equal parts, black, white, and Latino. And, um, you know, we had that... That's, that newsworthy thing in 1971, 1971. All, uh, all black team yes and uh, you know when that all black team went on to win the world series yeah right and so uh, they, they wrote a book about it it was called the team that changed baseball danny murtaugh one of the great guys i ever knew or played for uh was the manager then uh, that night in september i think it was september 1st 
and was swamped with writers after the game. You can't say swiped in Pittsburgh. <laughs> two or three guys came in and said, do you realize what you've just done? You've started all, all a diverse uh, lineup. I said, oh, wow, wow. that's something. I, I just thought I sent out the nine best pirates I had that night. Wow. Diffused the whole thing. Beautifully done wow. by Danny Murtaugh. And do you think Danny had? Do you, do you think he was thinking I, about that when he yeah, played? He yeah, had to kind of, yeah. Right? Danny was not dumb. He's uh, smart, but he diffused the whole magnitude of the. Oh, that, that that was it was a it was a magnitude in its own right. Yeah. But he diffused the whole sense of it by saying, "I thought I just set out the nine best pyres right. that night, and wow. uh, it was it was great." Uh, Murtaugh was so so good. Quick quick story about. Yeah. When we uh, at the end, this. yeah, the, so the, yeah, the club. <laughs> he, uh, first of all, he had this wonderful gift when he was airing you out. Uh, yeah, yeah he, <laughs> you know, you never had to worry about it. But if you were if bad, he would throw great, uh, great antics. Uh, in a post. He, he'd air you out. But his last thing, at, as he was airing you out, and he could do it as good as anybody. Right before he went back in his office. He would mumble something under his breath as he's looking toward everybody. And then he goes to the office, and we'd all sit around. Was that about me? Was that about me? <laughs> what, who's, he, who, who's he giving it to there? But uh, uh, Doc Ellis went in to air him out. Oh, we'll yeah, yeah, Doc, Doc Ellis. Doc's, Tell me about Doc Ellis. Yeah, oh, my God. <laughs> how much time you got? <laughs> so the, the doctor, uh, so he, something was bothering him. So he's, I'm going to go out, and, I'm going to go in there and straighten Murtaugh out. So we're all crowded around Murtaugh's door. He's in there for, for about three and a half minutes. He comes out, well, what, Doc, what was it? He says, I don't know. I, I, I forget what I went in there for. Because Danny could do double talk. And Doc came out. I've never seen Doc speechless, but he came out and said, oh, no, Doc, not very good work for you. So, oh, my gosh. So, but the, so Murtaugh, anyway, the, the story I want to tell you about, it involves Terry Bradshaw, too. When we, at the end of the year, we would get be ready for ball games, but the Steelers would come in from St. Vincent and work out in the morning. Because it's both at Three Rivers yeah, Stadium? Yeah, Three Rivers. Yeah. So they would quit when we took the field. Right. And Bradshaw would watch me. When I took the field, he would go into our locker room and he would take my cigars out of the top of my locker. <laughs> and finally I said, Terry, you, you know, you, you ain't doing anything to me because those are the cigars I stole out of Murtaugh's office. <laughs> I'm like the broker. You know, you're stealing Danny Murtaugh's cigars, so it really doesn't bother me. So, you're the drug dealer. You get a yeah, yeah, Murtaugh, I'm, Bradshaw yeah, gets yeah, some yeah. yeah, stop by at 4.30. Yeah, we'll make the deal. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, oh Danny, could, yeah, but he was he was one of those guys, Sean, that, that you could come in and you didn't have to worry about the manager, how he was going to be. It was one of the Billy Martin scenario where, how's Billy going to be tonight? Right, is he in a good mood? Is he yeah. hung over? Yeah, he's going to yeah. punch me. <laughs> If you were doing your job, you never heard from Danny Murtaugh. And uh, so those are the best. Yeah, right? so the best. But uh, yeah, the the those those years and, and the, the the racism stuff, uh, and, and we we had teams in the in, in the South, so it was it was right. tough. And we rode the buses. Did you ever have any conversations with those guys about it? Like, did you ever talk to Willie no. about it? Like, did you ever, did they have any emotions about it to you? Well, not not to me because we were close. You know, yeah. we 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 didn't. We, uh, you, we we didn't room together. Yeah. We didn't talk about it so much. You know, we were all. And, and to be quite honest, you're so absorbed, self-absorbed, coming up through my. You, right. The obsession is tunnel vision. So true. Got to get to the big leagues. Got to get to the big leagues. Yeah. But I remember Doc Ellis inviting me to his house in L.A., and uh, and and Clemente, uh, I mean, Clemente was just a, an honor to be in his presence, and and I had the honor that I never wanted to have at that time of doing reading the eulogy. In wow. Puerto Rico, after he passed away, I've never. Who, did, did Vera ask you to do that? Who asked you to do the, his eulogy? The background, real quick, of that. we had a, a PR guy, Bill Guilfoyle, who had worked for the Yankees, and when Clemente died, uh, he asked permission to paraphrase the Lou, Gre the Lou Gehrig eulogy. Yeah. And we were given permission to do that, and I read that, and I have it. I have the thing I read for. I made a plaque out of it. I, I have it in my home too. I wish I had the honor to do it 20 years later because I believe if Clemente had lived, he'd have been the governor of Puerto Rico. He had the clout, he had the yeah. intelligence, yeah. he had the support and love of the people. But, uh, you know, the, the, we all remember where we were when he passed. I was just going to say, where were you when he passed? We were having a New Year's Eve party because it happened. So Dave, Justin, Upper St. Clair, yeah. Dave and Jenny lived right up the street. And because we had epic parties, Right. There were four houses away, but we had them stay with us because I don't know if we could have gotten up the street. 
I could get four hours down. Or if I could have gotten to my room. <laughs> so they, Dave and Jenny stayed with us, but we got a call at four o'clock in the morning. It was this Bill Gilfoy saying, there's, there's a rumor that a plane went down in Puerto Rico and that Clemente was on it. And that's all he knew because they didn't have the 24-hour news loops that we have now. And so we couldn't sleep, so we went to Joel Brown's house and, and we couldn't confirm it until later on. But I still believe that morning we went to Willie Starge's house so, and because we couldn't get answers, confirmation. So when we finally did, in my mind, the way I phrase it is that when it was confirmed, the shoulders of the city of Pittsburgh slumped. Another plane crash last night, a four-engine DC-7 loaded with supplies for Nicaraguan earthquake victims fell into the ocean after takeoff from San Juan, Puerto Rico. Among five persons aboard, Pittsburgh Pirates baseball superstar Roberto Clemente. And, and it was so awful, awful, awful. Uh, and people remember where they were. And then we went to spring training later on, and it was awful again. And then we came to Pittsburgh to start the next season, and it was awful again. So it just went on and on, the grief. But you think about Clemente and his legacy. Now, there's a lot of great major league players who have done wonderful things, charity-wise, involvement in the committee. I don't know if anybody's had more of a legacy than Clemente, because every year there's a book, there's there's a documentary, there's a movie being made, there's a park named after him, the a street. Clemente Award. Yeah, and the Clemente Award itself. Yeah. But every, there's something that perpetuates that le legacy. And... Uh, just the pride of being around him. Yeah, yeah. My, my, my daughter, who's in sixth grade, or I think when she was in fifth grade, came home and she's telling me all about Roberto Clemente. They read a book about him. You know, I mean, it's like it, it his legend will always live yeah. on. And all think, the Latino players, oh, apparently. Uh, big time. Yeah, they well, all. Well, Dwayne, Dwayne Reeder has the uh, Clemente Museum here in, down in Lawrenceville. We're both so familiar. We're that. very familiar with it. It's such a wonderful place, but he, a lot of times, he'll have guys just pop in. You know, Carlos Beltran and, you know, Absolutely. a lot of different, Alex Corley, these yeah. odd different players. Yeah. That, Jorge Posada knocked on the door one day. He opened the door before the thing. It was, it was Jorge Posada, and, you know. And, it's uh, a and treasure I, in our city. It's a treasure. It's yeah. a treasure. And but it really. We've all given tours and everything. Yes, and seeing yes. people in there. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's a phenomenal testimonial. You know, I, I think one thing about, about Clemente uh, is that, you know, his, the legacy of him. All, all, but all around baseball, though, Steve, I think it, it's one thing, like, we as Pittsburghers love him so much. And, and you know, but that. The push now to get 21 retired. What do you think of that? I, uh, I, I, I'm aware of it and everything, and if, if it happens, it's fine, but I don't need it because I, yeah. I, have, I have him everywhere around me. When, yeah. when his name comes up, and I, I, I've got an 800 number. I right. mean, people call me <laughs> and want to talk about him, and yeah. I never say no. Dude, I never say no. And but so grateful that we have you. No, seriously, yeah. because... What a, what a line to, to Clemente that was with him all those years yeah. that, that gave his eulogy at his funeral. And I, I have absolute memory uh, moments of, of him and him in that World Series. In yes. That was his showcase, you know, and, and I, I, I finished very, very close second to him in the MVP. MVP, World. right, right, right. <laughs> so, so, you, you, win, you win game three and game seven and Clemente was the MVP. Yeah, well, <laughs> the thing is, any other situation, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to win it, but I understand the setting and the scenario because everybody in the baseball world finally saw what we'd been seeing for 20 years, and it was his World Series. And he was 37 at the time, yeah, right? And he, and, he, and he does extraordinary things. And, uh, you know, the next spring training we go, after he wins, I said, you know, you got the car for being the MVP. I understand. I should have got the tires. And then he, <laughs> he, should have, he said some things to me in Spanish that I cannot repeat because I, all I know is Spanish cussing. <laughs> me too. All those years in the biggies, and, all I know. And, and I'm quite good at it, but, and I, I remember some of it. But uh, it, was, it was such a joy and a, a story. And, and I, at first I was embarrassed about it. Now I'm proud I did it because now – we come in and off the field. We're celebrating. Now we're up on a platform. We're doing interviews with Bob Prince. And uh, he interviewed me, and I'm standing beside him. Now we're, the great Roberto Clemente, I'm standing there, and Clemente comes up, and I'm, I'm, I'm bobbling and gabbling. I'm, I'm insane. Uh, I was talking faster than you do. <laughs> That's tough to do. That's tough I, to I do. I understand, but I was on a racetrack road. <laughs> So he gets through with me. I said, skinny kid from Falls Village, Connecticut, da 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 you know, you know, all that. And then I stop and he brings Clemente up, and Clemente is perfectly composed. And, 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 and Prince says, Roberto, talk to me. And Roberto said, Bob, before I say anything about the game, I want to speak to my parents. 
and he's saying in, in Spanish, and so he's roaming on, and he just hesitates for a minute, and I said, Mr. and Mrs. Clemente, we love him too. <laughs> And I was embarrassed because I and I look back now and I'm so glad I did. It was so genuine, right? Yeah, it was a it, genuine. It was, moment. it was genuine. And so now the rest of the post game center view, uh, I'm over in one corner, he's over in the other. We finally get on the plane to come back to Pittsburgh, and we haven't started yet. Karen and I are sitting in, in a row. I'm on the window seat, and before I start, Clemente, who's up above, sitting in the rear, comes back through the run uh, the aisle. And stops on the road and he said, "Bless, come here and let me embrace you." Oh, wow! And that's a that's the truth from my heart. I would have climbed over six elephants to get to him, and I just went out and he gave me a hug. I didn't say one word, and I will remember, I will remember that moment for the rest of my life. Oh, my Roberto God. Clemente coming back and giving me a, let me embrace you. I, I I I won't forget that. I'll I'll never forget that. And just watching him perform out there. Uh, it's, it's just, uh, it was, it, it was a joy. It was, wow. it was a joy. Wow. And it, was it, was it fun for you? Uh, you know, because I think one of the knocks on Clemente was, Hey, he hasn't won the big one yet. You know, he hasn't, he hasn't, you know, he hasn't right. won that world series 60, yeah, in yeah, 60, yeah, but yeah, but, yeah. but, but that, you know, was, that was Maz's, that was Maz's yeah. Homer against the Yankees. Yeah. But like, I think when Clemente in 71, you know, he he showed everybody with it. What he could, he had a cannon of an, cannon of an arm. He could run. Yeah. He could hit, hit for power. And he, and, and he he'd run when when he ran, he galloped. Yeah. You know, some guys are, are are quick and light and, and small. Some the long straw. He galloped, but he still got there in time. Yeah. He still got there. I used to use his bat to bunt with, and he said, "Okay, Blas, you can use my, <laughs> but but don't you." Don't you, don't you, don't you never swing that bat. You break it, I will hunt you down your family, the entire family, cousins, cousins, everybody, everybody oh goes. God. Oh my God. So I, I, it was like a railroad tie. Yeah. It was, oh. it was 38 oh. ounces for 600 at bats. That's unbelievable how big his bat was. It's crazy. It's yes. crazy. I, I bunt with it all the time. Yeah. yeah so it was, Did you get the bunts down every time? Every time because you couldn't miss the bat. <laughs> Miss. Yeah, it was it was holding up a, a, a you know a guardrail on Route 79. So um, it, it was just so many so many aspects oh of him. Oh my gosh! But one one other story, and I promised that myself that I would tell this every time. So we're down two games to nothing in the World Series. Baltimore has got this team for the ages. Oh yeah. So Murtaugh beat the '61 Yankees team for the ages, Mantle Mayor. Then he beats the Orioles, who had won the World Series the year before. Won 100 games in 71, coming into that. Swept their playoffs. Beat us the first two games. We're down 2 nothing. And if you lose the third game, you're not going to beat a team like that. So and They were loaded, too. Like well, five, they had five 20-game winners. Four. Four, four 20-game 20 20 winners. Yeah. Brooks Robinson, Frank Hall Robinson. Hall of Famers, Hall yeah. Of famers, yeah. yeah. So now I pitched the third game. I got beat up in the, in the playoffs, which is another story. But now I pitched the game of my life, a three-hitter. So I'm getting interviewed on the first baseline by Tony Kubek after the game. And I'm on... Cloud nine, we're doing the interview. You know, Three River Stadium. I see this guy on the on the top of the dugout. He's trying to get through security. And, he's, and I'm doing the interview. Tony, yep, doing. I'm looking, wondering. And I look over, and he jumps off the dugout. It's ten feet above the ground. Oh God. As he hits the ground, takes two steps. It's my dad. Oh my gosh. And I won't insult anybody's emotion by making that up. My dad, this plumber from Falls Village, Connecticut, jumps off the dugout to be with his kid. Who just won the World Series? Oh my God, life! It's you know, we all have fathers, or have had fathers, and we've had singular moments. But that thing is is in my mind forever, and you can't make that up. You can't write a script for that. He came and he tells Tony Kubek, "You can throw me in the biggest jail you got here in Pittsburgh. I'm going to be with my boy." <laughs> oh my. And uh, it just you know, such a wonderful you, moment. You, you, you look back, all, all oh. of, look back in these singular moments you have, oh. and I so it was a. It was a World Series to, to to just dream about in so many so many ways. Well, those moments too, like I think that the reason baseball is such a great sport is the father son moments, and yeah. it's funny you say that singular moments. I had one of those moments with my dad, many a moment with my dad, but I remember um, in Game Four of the World Series in 2006 when I was with the Tigers, I homered off uh, Jeff Supon in like the for, uh, second or third inning, and uh, I remember rounding the bases, and I remember being in the, my backyard in Upper St. Clair. And I used to think, oh, it's Sean Casey. I used to say this out loud. Sean Casey homers in the World Series. 
And the crowd goes crazy. <laughs> Unfortunately, we were in St. Louis, so the crowd didn't go crazy. The crowd was like speechless. Yeah. Um, but but I remember yeah. my dad, my mom and dad were at the game, yeah. and my family, and it chokes me up to think of it now. But yeah. I remember coming into the um, the hotel after the game, and going in my parents' room and embracing my dad, yeah. and that yeah. that moment with my dad, I'll never forget, just because it was so much. There's so much history. Oh, so and much I, I love baseball because yeah. my dad loved baseball. I'm just it's so yeah. proud. Like, Homer in the World Series, I actually get a chance to embrace my dad after the game. And I remember him giving me, a, like, the biggest hug ever and just saying, I'm so proud of you, yeah. you know? There's there's nothing like those. And, and we're all very proud of what we achieved and everything. Yeah. And that stays with you forever. But, boy, those when those thoughts come back, when you pick your feet up late at night and have a <laughs> yeah. glass of wine, yeah. boy, ain't nothing better. There's nothing better. Because yeah. that's... You only get so many experiences, and, and yeah. boy, it's uh, it, it, we're we're lucky. We're so lucky. Yeah. We're so lucky. Yeah. Yeah. What about some of the teams that you face? Because oh. man, we're well, talking about, about the guys you played with, but, oh, the, but and the rookie, the rookie year facing Henry Aaron, yeah, facing oh William Mays. Oh so, to tell you about my first my first major league appearance. So I get called up after the call. You know, get your right, ass right. out of the right, right. <laughs> and so we go to Pittsburgh. We're in a hotel. Uh, one of my team is uh, Tommy Sisk. He was a, he was a yeah. pitcher we came up through together. So he's there. He's got an apartment with his wife, Donise. So he said, come stay with us. You know, well, we look for an apartment. So we go to the ballpark, go stay with him. Th- three days later, we're playing the Braves. We got a doubleheader. He starts game one. And uh, so I'm on the bullpen just hanging out, <laughs> just looking around. Right. He doesn't get anybody out. They call down the bullpen, get blast up. Oh, jeez. I go against, I go in the first inning against the Braves, and I face Henry Aaron, but I pitch five scoreless innings, and we wind up winning the game. So after we get through, they call Tommy into the, uh, Tommy, we're going to send you down to Columbus. I've got to ride back to the apartment where our wives away. He's devastated. I'm elated. <laughs> And we survived that somehow. He said, honey, I got sent down. I said, Karen, look what I did. And so we got through that, probably with with some help, with some alcohol. I'm saying alcohol. Lots of alcohol. Lots of alcohol. I say lots of alcohol. We had a few drinks. Yeah, he was drowning in the shadows. Yeah, I was climbing Everest. And and so we survived that, and and they they go back down. But... uh, but coming in to face I mean, West Covington. All, all, what was it like facing Aaron? If, if, what was it like when... Do when, you know how hard it is to throw strikes when you're shitting your pants? <laughs> <laughs> That's, you don't want to have anybody try to do it. And then there's, and there's, you know, there's, there's 18, 20,000 people, and we got the white uniforms on. <laughs> We don't even have the traveling grace. Like blast shit his pants. Yeah. Aaron's still walking to the to the to the plate. Yeah, I don't know if it was entirety, but there were skitters. <laughs> Tobacco stains, whatever you want to call them. But anyway, I, I got through that. So so now uh, we, we five days later, Murtaugh says, uh, you you're gonna start against the Dodgers. Sure. <laughs> oh my gosh. Don Drysdale's pitching. So we go to Dodger Stadium, the mecca of pitching. I'm looking around. There's 40,000 people there. So they have the big jumbotron. Tonight's starters for the Dodgers, Don Drysdale, 6-1, and 3.2 ERA. He's leading the league early on in strikeouts, da-da-da-da-da. And for the Pirates, Steve Blass. <laughs> so I, they hand me the ball. It feels like a shot put. And I go out, and I win. The, I pitch a complete game. I beat Drysdale 4-2 to two in my first major league start. Oh my God! They, they got Willie Davis. Uh, they got Tommy Davis. They got Maury Wills. They're throwing, you know, they're all over the place. So Smokey Burgess is my catcher. All Smokey Burgess ever wanted to do was hit a baseball. <laughs> all he wanted, he didn't care too much for, for catching. So I'm in there in the fourth inning, and in between innings, now I'm doing great and everything. I call Smokey. I do have a breaking ball. <laughs> <laughs> they got all the speed. We're throwing heaters. Yeah, they, 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 because he's he, trying he, to throw guys out. Yeah, right? he wants to. <laughs> and I got, I got uh, 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 the manager Leo DeRocher coaching third base. He taught me things, swearing and hollering at me that I'd never heard back in Falls Village, Connecticut. 
<laughs> and when I stop looking at him, I look at Frank Howard, and every time he swings, I think the bat is this close to me. Oh He's six foot thirty. Yeah. <laughs> and weighs eight thousand pounds. And he's got this little bitty toothpick in his oh hands. My, oh my God. So that's that's how. We, so now we go to, we go to Candlestick, and here's oh Willie Mays. God. I think I still got his bubblegum card in my back pocket. <laughs> so uh, in this, uh, he he gets up to fit, uh, hit in the third inning, and uh, I'm fixing Willie Mays. Willie Mays, and he nubs the ball down wide to first base. Don Clennon's for first base. And in my amazement that the ball is not in San Francisco Bay, I'm a step late getting to first base. You know, I got a quarter right. to cover. <laughs> and uh, so he beats me by a bang, bang play. He beat, beats us out for a base hit. So we go on to win the game, 9-2. to two. The next day, the coach says, uh, Danny Murta, I'd like to see you in his office. I said, oh, that's great. I'm a rookie. Good. I have a little father-son chat. You didn't know. So I walk in, and he puts his arm around me. He said, nice job. I said, yeah, sure, Danny. <laughs> And he says, uh, that amazes some, isn't he? I said, yeah, he is. He says, uh, he can really get down the line, can't he? I says, yeah. He said, it'll cost you $100. See if you can beat him there next time. And oh, no. don't spell my name wrong on the check. <laughs> Another one of those life lessons. Oh, my gosh. Go stay in the club. Get house. over. Get, yeah, get over and cover first base. So, uh, but uh, just a rookie year. Oh All I did is win five games, but I pitched against Willie Mays, Henry Aaron, uh, I thought, by the way, Henry Aaron might have been one of, if not one of the best baseball ambassadors we were lucky to have, mm-hmm. all things considered. I, all the things he could do on the field. Uh, when I stopped playing and started broadcasting a little bit, I had a little pregame show called Blast is Best where I'd interviewed. And this is after he uh, he stopped playing. And I had to call his office. They told me, and his secretary said, well, uh, I'll ask Mr. Aaron, and uh, uh, she called back and said, "Yes, you can interview him." I sat down with him and I said, "Please, to to uh, Richard Sutphin, our producer, I said, please just let me talk and talk, and then you can cut it down all you want. Add you know B-roll uh, music right. in the back." Sp- spoke to him for forty minutes, and I will never forget j- being in his, in his presence. And he wow. couldn't have been nicer. Could not have been wow. more classy and. Is there Just, a, is there a story he told you that you that you remember from that interview? That, well, he, he he did say he said you had one of the best sliders. Oh, no, did he really? Yeah. He, yeah. And he also oh, told me that I remember when you were struggling the last two years, right. and I came in out of the bullpen. I was, you know, Bill Verden was trying everything. Right. Came into a game in Atlanta, and couldn't do anything. I struck Henry out on three sliders. He's the, probably one of the only guys I got out that night. Oh I mean, I threw fastballs in back of Ralph Gar. Gar. <laughs> uh, uh, it was just awful right. at that time. But I, I threw per, three, Put per, three perfect sliders to Henry Aaron. Oh, and my God. He, said, he says, that amused me a little bit later on. He said, I wasn't too happy about it that night. <laughs> just to watch him and, and, uh, and, and you, you watch when you're not pitch. Watching Clemente go against Juan Marichal. It was like the Dominican Republic against Puerto Rico. And you remember Marichal had 25 pitches. Five from here, five from here, five from there, five from there. And plus you get that big foot in front of you and back up each one of them. So, yeah. so it was, it was, and he tortured Clemente. And so Clemente come back and uh, I, if I pitched against Marichal, he, he wouldn't let me use his bat. He was so upset about everything. Yeah. I couldn't use the bat with the Oh my gosh. But what about what about? I'm, I'm interested oh, in this because Willie the, McCovey. Oh Willie. yes, Willie McCovey. So we're Forbes Field, okay? I'm absolute monster of a human in the box. Four fifty-seven to center, and in back of that you've got most of Pitt campus, and then you got the Shenley Park Golf Course. Okay, oh he hits a ball one night that is rising over the four fifty-seven sign. Come on, we can't even <laughs> see Matty Alou because it's so far <laughs> out the short in the in the evening, and the ball kept going. And it wound up disrupting a foursome on the Shenley Park golf course. And I have a friend to this day that says, if you look close in the eastern sky every Monday around 10 o'clock, you can still see the ball orbiting the earth. <laughs> I mean, stretch. He, it, was, it was something. He wound up sending a limo to the San Francisco airport every time we'd come into town to make sure nothing would happen to me coming in from the airport to the hotel so I wouldn't miss my turn. 
very nice gesture on, on big stretch. Who were some of the guys that, that who are some of the guys you owned and who are some of the guys that owned you? Obviously McCovey's one of them. Okay, I didn't own anybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the yeah. tough ones you want it alphabetically or by number. <laughs> Uh, uh, the, first of all, no slouch one. here. You say what you say here, but I got your numbers here, and we're gonna we're gonna compare and contrast who you think you did well again, oh, but oh you did God, pretty well against again. a lot of people. <laughs> oh, 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 I have to go home. <laughs> <laughs> Any, anyway, Billy Williams was the toughest. Yeah, of the Cubs. I helped him put put him in the Hall of Fame. So now I'm pitching at the Cub against the Cubs one day, and it was one of the best games I ever pitched because I pitched. A complete game four hitter on Bill Mazeroski's birthday, oh September 9th, 1969. And uh, Billy Williams went four for four. You can check this out. Two doubles and two home runs. We beat him <laughs> nine to two. What? And oh, he's wow. the only guy that got a hit that day. Four <laughs> if he's sick, I'm in Cooperstown. <laughs> <laughs> you are in Cooperstown. Perfect game. Yeah. So, seven homers and 87 plate appearances against you. Oh, how many? Seven homers, 14 ribbies, 313, 87 plate appearances, 80 at bats. Or, we can we can we can stop right now. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, no, that, I want to go to the other side. Hank Aaron, you're talking about, right? Yeah. Five home runs, career wise. Yeah, five home runs, but how's this case? 255 batting average, five strikeouts. So and this is over 59 five plate appearances. I started 40 games <laughs> Yeah, but come on. It's Hank Aaron hit 255 against five you. Five strikeouts against Aaron? <laughs> That's pretty good, man. Well, five That's a good blast. You can say you struck out Hank Aaron five times. Well, you know, he gave up five home runs. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, but he hit 255 anyway. against you. You, beat, you. you got the better of Henry Aaron. Let's put it that way, I would say. As yes, the producer, that's a thing, yeah. you know, it, it, you know, unfortunately, Henry's gone now, so he can't dispute. That. <laughs> yeah, he can't defend himself. So now, so now, I'm pitching this game. By the way, this game, uh, God, I hit my only home run in, in this ball game. Oh, this, this wow, what game. a game for you! Well, you know, it's so long ago, I don't remember much about it except it was September fifth, nineteen sixty nine. It was seventy three degrees, winds out of the southwest at five miles an hour, humidity forty three percent, party cloudy skies, crowd was twenty three thousand four hundred and twelve. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, you know, I hit the home run. I ran to first, and the coach said, take a left, because I had always peeled back into the dugout. But, uh, was the, the wind was blowing out that day at Wrigley? 55 miles an hour. <laughs> That's amazing that you only give up four hits. Yeah, and, and he got all and four. He got all and, and two doubles and two home runs. Right, right. So it was a great day for him. Right. And uh, so, but, so Maz and I go out to uh, celebrate. It's his birthday. Yeah. And I have the game of my life, hit my only home run, and we're in Chicago, one of the great drinking cities oh, in America. Boy, yeah. <laughs> so we're out, uh, we're out in the street at four o'clock uh, in the afternoon, and then maybe four we're o'clock in the and morning. The, and the we hit BPs four, in four hours. You know, we're in trouble when you hit four o'clock twice. <laughs> so I'm, I'm on cloud nine the next day. I'm sitting in the dugout. You know, I'm, I'm fine. I'm throwing up in the corner. And Maz has got to play. And so we finally get through that game. And after the game, Maz and I were rooming together. We go back to the room. He's, he said, he says, you're sitting there on vacation, and I'm playing second base, and every ball that goes up in the air, I six ball, I ca uh, there's six balls, and I catch them all. <laughs> That's how good he was. So, um, uh, the, oh Chicago, the, there, the day games in Chicago, oh, I mean, jeez. Epic. Few, epic. I've had yeah. a few of those games. Wait. Durham is nothing. <laughs> nothing compared. To, uh, Wait, Case, one more thing. Sorry to interrupt. 1973, 29 plate appearances. This man hit 417 with two doubles. 10 for 24, Sean. Yeah, and my, and my record was 3 and 9 with a 9 ERA. <laughs> it was all about hitting that season, Blast. It was um, who's the last 400 hitter for the Pirates? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Here's, here's the belt I got for you. <laughs> It's all good. Oh, it's what all about what about your time facing the? I know the Reds were that was a big rivalry, and those the, guys I know the, those guys that came up were the, the decade of yes. the seventies. Pirates and Reds. I, I talked to Pete Rose every once in a while. He said it's the best quality baseball he's ever been around. The big red machine, and that seventy, uh, you know, it was, it was it was the lumber company later on in the decade, yeah. but early on, I mean, it was such good. It was the the hitting was great, but the pitching was good too because. They had Billingham, yeah. Don, Gullett, Don Gullett, yeah, Belly, uh, Jack Billingham, yeah, and yeah, all yeah. those guys, uh, and uh, so uh, Bob Prince called him Lord Billingham. <laughs> <laughs> he was an intimidating figure, wasn't he? Jack was Jack. He was good. Yeah, 
Yeah. And, uh, but you, you talked about that story about Rose, didn't you? You, you? Pete Rose, yeah. You did I, something that not many people have ever done in, I struck him out him. three times in one game. And that only happened to him twice in his career, That's right? what I understand. You can yeah. look that up, but it, it didn't happen very often. Yeah. But I, I got him three times. We had Maury Wills, who came up each at bat and kind of worked me through the lineup. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm, uh, now it's, it's post-career, and I'm interviewing Pete when he's a player manager at, at, yeah. uh, at, down at, uh, at, in Cincinnati. <clears throat> and we get to the point where he's giving me cliche answers and the standard answers. Oh, and I said, yeah. well, Pete, let's, let's juice this up a little bit. Do you remember that I struck you out three times in one game? Do I remember? Yes. And do you, do you remember, Blast, that I went four for four against you on NBC Saturday afternoon game of the week? Do you remember that? And here are the pitches I got him off. I said, <laughs> I knew all too brute, touche. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It's but so uh, the the that the, those those matchups were were something. Then we 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 got them in the playoffs. Uh, and we, uh, we got the first time we got we in the playoffs. Uh, the Reds beat us three in a row. And I didn't pitch, and so finally in '72 I get to pitch because we win our divisions, and I pitched the first game, and now Joe Morgan leads off. Okay, good hitter, always good Hall of Famer. So I turn a little slider over to keep the ball on the ground. He left-hand hitter. He goes out, not only gets it, gets it and gets it and turns around, hits the ball over the right center field wall. Oh, he whips it. Off a really good sinking fastball. I said, well, that's it, boys. That's the last fastball you're going to see tonight, this afternoon. I threw him more junk. I, I could have so been. What were, you, what were you throwing him? Just curveballs? The, uh, the old slop drop, dead fish. Yeah. Flip, uh, Sang used to call it the old, fl- you know, he would throw the old Flip Wilson now. <laughs> Ask me about his mount, mount conferences after, but this particular game, nothing but slop. Rose would holler up, eat a steak, pitch like a man, you know, screaming at me the whole game. <laughs> but that's the only, the only fastball they got the rest of the game. Oh and uh, we, we won the game five to one. <laughs> You made the adjustment. You're like, yeah. no more of those pitches. Yeah. So no. now we go on in that particular series. I'm going to pitch the fifth game. We're tied two-two, and I'm I'm ahead three to two in the in the after seven innings. Uh, Geronimo, I hit or one of them hit a home run, and then Rose hit a ball that hit in the artificial turf on a oh, seam yeah. over Stars. So I'm pitching good. So I go seven innings, and I think we're going to the World Series. Okay, so. Uh, I set up this thing with a contractor in St. Clair. I had an upper, kind of an upper driveway on, on asphalt. So I think we're going. So I called this guy and said, I want concrete. We're going to win this thing. So I want to order that. So I ordered concrete. So now uh, I leave the ball game. Dave Justy comes in and throws bench a, uh, uh, a high palm ball. Now that ties it up. Then Moose throws a wild pitch. That ties it up. And Moose throws the wild pitch. And... Here goes the World Series. <laughs> and so as Jesse throws the tying uh, home run, Moose throws a wild pitch. I run into the clubhouse. I call up my contractor. I said, scratch the concrete. We're going back with asphalt. <laughs> <laughs> so my old roommate, Dave Jesse, you know, you know, by the way, by the way, in that post game, pitched 10, 10 and a third scoreless innings between the post game and the World Series. And he was, he was so, so great. Just didn't happen when, when I needed <laughs> when you I needed, needed concrete. You needed concrete. I needed you had to go concrete. back to the asphalt. You've seen my driveway. Yeah. Just go straight up. <laughs> yeah, you know, I struggled that with our driveway for years. Oh, my gosh. Thanks, but uh, we were roommates for years. And I'll tell you something about Dave Jussie. He saved a lot of games. He, he, he became a, a, a great, great relief pitcher. But when I was going through my nightmare of 1973 and 74, and we were on the road, he was there with me every night every night and uh you know you don't forget stuff like yeah. that he was there with the good times but uh you know he was a great friend our kids grew up together in upper st Clair. yeah and so uh, it was it was good by the way when when he was finishing up his career not not doing well with the cubs uh i was there was an old golf course in uh, in upper st Clair, hidden valley in valley yeah so i'm down there after playing golf and he's struggling he's struggling so and so I decided to struggle with him in the post golf game and uh, the miracle of alcohol. I called Karen from the golf course and I said, Karen, I've got to go salvage my buddy. So I flew to Chicago. Did? And he had a little place he was renting. I salvaged his um, 
career, not well. We went out. He said, thanks for coming out. You know, it's been a tough time. I said, I came out to yeah. give you support. Bartender. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I came out to support you like you support me. So I wake up the next morning. He's already gone to the ballpark at Wrigley. And I go out, and I'm sweating like a pig. I'm out in the outfield. <laughs> and it's just, it was just. Are you off. in the bleachers? I'm in the bleachers sweating. And I see, I don't know if the phone was down or something, but I see somebody, the manager come out and said, Get me the right hander, and Dave comes into the game, and, and it's not pretty. It's good. So I left before the game was over, and I went to O'Hare and flew home. <laughs> I couldn't face him. He forgave me. Uh, he forgave uh, me. I think it was two weeks ago. So well, at least he had I, your back, and you had his yeah, back. It was the gesture. It's all about all good about, intentions. The road to ruin is paved. Good not, with, not with concrete. With good intentions. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, Blas. But so, then, but, yeah, so, so Blas. So after you're done, you know, you got this amazing career. You know, you've 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 all star games. Yeah. Well, first off, do you have any all an all star oh, game story? My, yeah. For us? Speaking of the Reds, so now yeah. <laughs> I go to down to Atlanta for you know, here. Here's the representation. This is '72, the year after. It's I've got a picture of me, Stargell, Clemente. Al Oliver and Manny Sanguin. That's a pretty good group wow. to send down to the hall for the All Star game. So we fly down to Atlanta. And how about this? On the ride, Clemente, this is before he meets me uh, after the World Series in an airplane. He comes back and said, Steve, would you and Karen like to have dinner with Vera and I in Atlanta? <laughs> I'm not busy that day. <laughs> when is it? I'm not busy. Yes, when, yes, yes. Yes, yes, please. Thank you. <laughs> So, uh, so that was another highlight about the All-Star. So now we go down, and walking into an All-Star dugout, or locker room. I'm sorry. You know how yes, that is. The oh, there's Aaron. There's Mays. There's yeah. Carl. There's Seaver. There's oh uh, Bob Gibson. Uh, there's another Gibson story. But uh, So now uh, I go to my locker, and it's next to Johnny Bench. And back then, there was no fraternization back then. Even at the All-Star game, there was, yep. though, right? Yeah. So I sit down. I said, hey, Johnny, how are you doing? He said, good. He said, uh, I understand you're pitching the third inning because they used to orchestrate it like that a little bit, you know, their structure. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm pitching the third. He said, well, what kind of signs you want? You know, one's a fastball, two is a curve, three is a... I said, well, Johnny, every time I face you, you seem to know what's coming. So why don't we just wing it? <laughs> So we had a good, we had a good laugh. So Wait, I, I got to read you off your starting lineup, your offensive lineup for that: Joe Morgan, Willie Mays, Hank Aaron, Willie Stargell, Johnny Bench, Lee May, Joe Torre, Don Kessinger, and your starting pitcher was Bob Gibson. Holy shit! That? Oh my gosh! I can work with that. Yeah. You want to hear the other lineup? Let me give you the other lineup case: Rod Carew, Bobby Mercer, Reggie Jackson, Dick Allen, Carly Skrimsky, Yastrzemski, <laughs> Bobby Gritch, Brooks Robinson. Bill Freehan, Jim Palmer, Palmer what, starting pitcher. That might be one of the greatest all-star games what of all am time. I, doing there? <laughs> I could have had three nice days off with my family. Holy cow. I could have, I could have paid my driveway. Because you were second in Cy Young that year, Blast. It's unbelievable. That's why you were dominating. second. You were yeah. dominating. Yeah, well, how about second. this? Carlton, the Phillies go 59 and something. He wins 27 of the 59. Oh, my a distant, gosh. A, 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 and, you know, back in the day, I didn't have an agent. I negotiated my contract the next year without knowing I finished second. Oh, really? Yeah. What? How did? What? What, what kind of raise did you get? Not much. <laughs> Honest to God, I think. I, well, I went. I went from, um, I think, sixty to seventy-five grand. Did I you was win? delighted. That's, that's I mean, great. So now the next spring training, the great thing, we're the world champions, and so there's a fantasy league. Okay, <laughs> so uh, I, I'm in the fantasy league, helping out and everything. So. There's these old fantasy guys, all the old guys that, that yeah. uh, are in their 60s and 70s. They come to pretend they're major leaguers. They put their uniforms. They yeah, play games. Love, so love those guys. I go back to the I go back to the clubhouse for something. Up against our um, our fence, there at uh, at Pirate City, I walk out and there's a car pulled up and it's got Pennsylvania plates, and I see this elderly man and his wife. They're looking at the you know the chicken wire fence. They're looking at these guys playing golf, fantasy leaguers, <laughs> and I hear this guy say to his wife. Gee, I hope they get better by April. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! That's so, so great. So, um, you know, another one, one of those, one of those stories you have. But I negotiated. I held out. Actually, I this, with Joe Brown, I, I made the mistake of coming down to spring training, and I'm uh, we're only twenty five hundred dollars apart. Right. But I, 
I make the mistake of going to the ballpark, and I'm hanging on this same fence watching my teammates who just won the World Series. They're out there working out. And you don't do that when you're hanging out. Right. I'm looking at like a kid <laughs> looking in the ice cream store. I want to get out there. I'm going to be tough. I'm looking at my, I'm almost crying. I got tears in my eyes. Look at these guys. We're going to win it again. And I'm hanging on the fence, and Joe Brown comes up and says, looks like fun, doesn't it? The general manager who I'm negotiating, <laughs> negotiating No with. agent. I said, yeah, it looks like fun. <laughs> and he says, you can keep 2,500. I, I said, I said, can we talk? He said, no. I said, can we flip a coin for 2,500? I said, he says, no. I said, give me a pen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I want to get out there. Unbelievable. Oh my gosh. Unbelievable. So what's the Bob Gibson story? Oh, oh so the Gibson. So Bob Gibson, uh, you know, he has a little reputation of, of throwing some of head hunting pitches <laughs> and enjoying it. Yes, yes. So we're playing a game against the Cardinals, and of course, Willie Starza hits a home run the first time up. So the next next time up, of course, he drills him like oh, wow. that. Wow. And I'm pitching, and Danny Martell looks over at me, and, and I said, yeah. <laughs> so I go out there, and Gibson comes up. He's six foot six, 240. Oh, he he's wants you to drill Gibson. Well, I have to. Oh, my god. I have to. And I've just married, yeah, I've been ma married a year. I don't want to die. <laughs> And so I got to, go out there, oh and he's six six two forty. I'm six foot nothing and weighs seven, sixty seven pounds. And it takes me three pitches, but I finally hit him in the ribs, and I said, "This could be it for me." <laughs> draw, draw the drink. He puts the bat down and he goes to first base. Doesn't look at you or anything. No, he knows why I did yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. It's the professionalism we had, and there was no posturing. There was yeah. none of this nonsense. And uh, that's, and Will, you know, Willie knows I had to do, I had to do it. I knew I had to do it. And, you know, everybody realized the, the umpires had to get involved. And so we go on. But, damn, there's only one more time that I was more scared. I had been in the league a couple of years, and we go to the Mets, and I'm going to pitch against Nolan Ryan, T, or Nolan Ryan when he's 19 years old. Oh, my God. So Effectively ne wild. <laughs> <laughs> this is Frog's ass waterproof. <laughs> Yeah, so, so now uh, I'm in the on-deck circle. There's 30,000 people at Shea Stadium, and I'm saying, Karen's going to have a baby. Uh, she's probably, I'm, I'm looking forward to a nice life after baseball, but I think this is the end. Because I go up, and Jerry Grody's the catcher, so I'm digging in front of all these people, and I, st I step back out with one foot, and I say, Jerry, here's the deal. I said, three pitches, and I'm out of here. I don't have any problems. I don't have any problems. But here's the deal. Look at him out there. He's got shit coming out of his nose. His eyes are crossed. He's pouring at, pawing at the dirt like a bull. He's 19 years old. He throws 200 miles an hour, and he doesn't know where the ball is going. So here's the deal, Jerry. If he hits me and I live through this, I'm friggin' hitting you. I'm, and that's the deal. So he calls time, and he goes out and talks to him. Comes back, three pitches him out of there, and life goes on. Oh. So, uh, so my heart he, is still he, beating. <laughs> I, I mean, I've never seen anything oh like that. Gosh. And you know, the great thing about Gro uh, Ryan is that in f later years when I saw him, if you were pitching out there, okay, and he hits a home run off you, r no one would look at you going around the bases. And if you act professionally, he's fine. He watches you making the circle all the way around. But if you start acting like an asshole and celebrating and doing all this, he stops looking at you. And he turns around and he looks at the guy in the on deck circle because <laughs> he's the one that's going to get it. And everybody knew that. And we had an outfielder that we had somebody do that. And all he did, it was like he put his bat down in the on deck circle and rolled off on his back like he's a dog <laughs> on his back knowing he's going to die. <laughs> Oh my gosh! Oh, so what? What do you think of those? It's unbelievable those stories. What do you think of? How could Nolan Ryan pitch in today's game? And, and like, just what do you think of the way? You know that 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 whole thing's handled. How you know it's more the warnings now from pitchers and, and the, how the game's changed. Well, I, I think there's a, a better awareness of why somebody gets thrown at. Yeah. Why it doesn't? It's either wildness. He's up in the big leagues too early. One of the great quotes I, th I thought it was by, by Boone of, of the Reds. And we've had a couple wild kids. And so, well, all right, uh, he hit a bunch. He, he keeps hitting our batters. You know, get, everybody gets upset. He hit. And so, well, 
it, it, he's not throwing at people. He just doesn't have good control. And Booney said, well, why is he here then? Why is he here at the big league level? I thought that was a good point. I like that. I like that. And, uh, so, uh, but I think there's awareness of, of when somebody is, is throwing at somebody inappropriately. Sometimes they don't know. And um, so that, that has changed. But so many things about Nolan Ryan. First of all, the longevity, 24 years without a trick pitch. Right. Come on, that, that kind of it's stuff ridiculous. is unbelievable. Uh, and just not fooling you too much. You, you got the big curveball and, and, and a fastball yeah. and survive and survive and uh, pitching for teams that weren't great. Uh, so those kind of guys that stick around and, and pitch that long, you know, the, the knuckleballers can do that sometimes. But yeah, but it's tough he was, for a he, power he, pitcher like he, him. He was a presence, man. He, yeah. he was, a, he was a, a, a unbelievable. When we were had training, when, when I was broadcasting, and we were going to go down to Port Charlotte because the Rangers were down there, oh, yeah. we'd leave early. I'd go down there to watch him warm up, throw in between stars. <laughs> I mean, just to have the, the, the awe of somebody like him. Yeah. Sandy Koufax. Yeah. He had this, and he had that, and that was enough, and you, you were going to get one or the other. After I won Game 3 of the World Series, he was broadcasting for NBC. He came over the next day and said, Steve, can you give me five minutes for an interview? I said, Sandy, how much a month? Do you need a month? <laughs> you, may, you, you remember, uh, you want me to drive your car back to the hotel? <laughs> Here, come on, let me buy you a drink. What we do your doing? laundry? Well, maybe not that. Maybe oh, not the laundry. My, yeah, you know, I, I know a laundromat down here. We can go to. But anyway, just to being in his press, he asked me to give him an interview. Yes. I, I said, I said, Sandy, it's an honor. Uh, I awesome. said, you need a month? I can give you five minutes. I'll give you a month, whatever you know. <laughs> so he had me and Bob Robertson over because R- Robbie oh, yeah, had, Robertson, hit, yeah. he had hit a three-run home run. That, so he said, well, Steve, thanks so much. And Robbie's right here. And I said, no, 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 no. We ain't done yet. <laughs> I'm not done. Yeah, so they had to stop the tape. <laughs> Bob Robertson said, he's standing there like oh a God. mental patient. <laughs> <laughs> and I won't let Sandy go. Oh, God. I said, oh. Sandy, I grabbed his shirt. Don't, don't stop. <laughs> don't stop talking to me, please. please I love you. Please, I love please. you. Let's sit in the booth with you. But. Blast, with you being on the other side, because I know for me, like being in the being in MLB Network and, yeah. and you know being in the media for 14 years, and you know one thing that dro- drove me crazy was like when you, you get guys that kind of big league you sometimes. Oh, I can't do an interview. And like I want to be like, dude, I played 12 years in the big leagues. Like, yeah, really, yeah. Did you? Feel that same way, or do you ever have any guys? Every, every once, you? Yeah, a couple of guys, and yeah, you know, I, I get it, but I think less of them. <laughs> yeah, you know, because perfect. You, know, you got to keep track that people have a job to do. You know, the writers have a job to do. You know, the writers would come in. I've had a good game. They we talk, talk, talk. They said, "Hey, thanks, Steve." And then they leave us. Wait, 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 let me tell you what something happened in the sixth inning. Come here, come, come, come back here. Right, right. But I don't know if you feel this way. I love being interviewed, as you yeah. can tell. <laughs> no, <laughs> seriously. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> but when I start doing the, the interviews, I would think ahead to what I was going to say, so I didn't listen right. well. <laughs> and so, or else I was scared to death that I would go blank. So I, I was a horrible interviewer. But I, I was a good interviewee because I, I loved to talk. And, I, you know, I, I, as you might guess. Uh, <laughs> That's one of the toughest things. That was one of the toughest things Keep for me. track of the interview. Yes. Make sure you listen, listen. while you think of, you of the follow next up. question. Yeah. And if you have a place to go. And, and I, uh, when I first started, uh, I, I would be going along, rolling good. And then he would talk. He would finish. His, and I would. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and in my mind, I said, please think of something yeah isn't it funny the hardest thing to do first grade teacher yeah. <laughs> the hardest <laughs> Yeah, it is blue. It's yeah. not, still blue, isn't it? The oh, hardest God. thing to do when you're interviewing somebody is actually listen to them. Isn't that the weirdest thing? It is. It yeah. is, honest Well, to because God. you get all the questions. What I found is you get all the questions lined up. So you got your five, six questions. And then you say something that has nothing to do with my questions. And there's nothing worse for the person that's listening. It's because why don't you follow up on that question? I'm like, hey, you, know, you know, and you, you go to your next question without, without listening yeah. to what yeah. the hell is being said. And so you think of something and it's, what's the color of your car? It has yeah. nothing to do with what he just said. <laughs> Exactly. It's, it's, exactly. It's, it's, it's a death. With, yeah. it's, a, it's the dead air that's it, it, the death. It's so true. How yeah. about the game nowadays, Steve? I mean, the great thing about you is you've been in the booth just for – you just got retired after the 2019 season. So, 34 you know, years. 34 broadcasting. years. So, so can you talk about the evolution of the game and where do you – what do you like about the game now? What, what, what don't you like about it? And, you know, yeah. what, what's changed so much? It, it has changed. You know, I hate, to, uh, I hate to sit here and think it was better – Greg Brown, when I when I start griping about the current game, game, Greg will say, 
what do you think those guys that were born, uh, playing before you? So, what are these kids doing? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So there's there's that evolution. Uh, it's just uh, I'll be quite, it's not it's not the game I grew up with in in, in some areas. You know the yeah. pitching and uh, a lot of the the, the tech, uh, the high tech, the technology, the analytics. Um, it was a simpler time, for better or for worse. Right. I always thought that the less clutter you had, uh, in my my standpoint as a pitcher, the, the simpler was the, the simpler was the better it was for me to concentrate, not worrying about the, the tunneling. I don't know what the hell tunneling means. Tunneling, man. yeah, yeah. Tunneling. Spin rate. No, the tunneling rate. is a four pit tunnel in rush hour. <laughs> Uh, it, it, it's Squirrel Hill Tunnel outbound at four o'clock. It's it's it's, it's a tragedy. Uh, so I mean, it's 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 different. I, I've got to I've got to say that, and and I shouldn't say it's better and worse. It's just different than the game that I grew up with. Uh, so the the analytics and to me, and I, I'm probably wrong because it's self serving. I think twenty percent of the people who listen or watch want to be totally educated. And I think 75 or 80% want to be entertained. Right. Because baseball is such a game about stories. Right. I mean, it, it, it's unique, I think, uh, when you compare other sports because there are so many games and there's leisure time for pitchers. It's a, it's a lot of these stories and that's where a lot of it is. But it's, it's, it's got, it had a foundation of stories. You know, remember when this guy did, remember right. Clemente or remember the catch at Willie Mays against... Vic Wirtz in the 54 series. Um, so many stories, so many stories. So that's a background. And you can't intrude on the game uh, w- with just stories. You can't do that either. So you walk that line. Uh, uh, the pitching stuff, 100 pitches. Yeah. What, yeah. Uh, uh, the, the obsession with speed. Uh, uh, so that that's different. And, and it's, it is just different. Maybe that's the direction we have to go in. What about the bat flips now? I think that's like, it's really getting yeah. into a place where you yeah, like, the Yeah, wow. ce- the celebrations. So the, the high five for, for, for a sacrifice bunt. Yeah. It's part of your job. Right. Uh, so, um, but it's, it's it's the way it is. It's yeah. uh, it's way to, and think of how good a game, baseball, with the stuff that's been thrown at it. Right. Not just the analytics and the current state of the game. I'm talking about, you know, b- back with the, the drug hearings and yes. and 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 the, the salaries that uh, that the average guy that works, you know, is there a resentment there? Um, I always said, boy, wouldn't it be a better world if nobody knew what anybody else's salary was in the universe? Yeah, right. <laughs> yes. Uh, so it's it's different. I don't want to be critical because uh, because I don't want to be critical. It's 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 the game that and it's, I still it's love. Evolving. I, and, it's yeah, evolving. I, I love it too. And I, I, and I and if I if I, if I go nuts about like uh, Snell on the World Series getting lifted with a one hitter, yeah. uh, Clayton Kershaw the other night a perfect a game. Perfect game, yeah. Uh, so that has changed. Uh, um, the complete games. Gibson started thirty seven games one year and had twenty eight complete games. Um, but it's different. I I, I don't want to say it's it's uh, it's it's worse now because it's not it's still it's our game and i i, I love it to pieces and i i can't uh, that'll never change it's, it's different yeah. let me just put it that way yeah. Yeah. uh i still wish pitchers went longer in games uh relief pitchers starting games that's it's 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 different it goes against what i grew up with doesn't doesn't make what i grew up with better right yeah so right I, I'll, what, I'll what about what about shohei otani what huh. do you think of him that's that's unique. Uh, that's fabulous. It's a fabulous story. I mean, that he can do that, uh, and you know, we all we all think we could hit and pitch, but that's <laughs> that's out of that's well. You hit four seventeen one year. So you, I did. And Twenty-four. I had, and I had one consecutive home run. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Only seven less the guys that have had seven games. Seven. Yeah. You know, you know, it's only seven away. Um, but yeah, that, that that's unique. And there is those u- unique stories. And I will tell you something. When I watch or listen to the games, there's still something that I will see every night or every afternoon that is unique, that, that makes that makes me feel good about our game of baseball. Yeah. There's, something, all, there's always something that's going to happen. And uh, uh, my only issue is, is that uh, you, you can't argue, argue box anymore. Right. Yeah, yeah. When did that? I don't even know that rule came into being till two weeks ago. You can't I argue Because I, I never knew the rules. Yeah. Were the broadcast. <laughs> but that was part of it. What I In the rookie league, the, the, the umpires are rookies too. So I balked one night and he said, 
you balked. And they sent the guy a second. I said, what did I do? He said, you balked. And I said, what did I do? He said, you balked. And we went back and forth like that for 20 minutes. Would you? We never resolved it. Finally threw me out of the game. Because I wouldn't stop. What did I do? He said, you balked. I think you're the manager out, too. Oh, my God. We couldn't continue because oh nobody God. answered. Oh yeah, we never so got great. any answers. So great. So it's, it's different. What about, you know, we, we've had a ton of guys on here, uh, you know, talking about Jim Leland. You know, I know you I know you never played with Skip, but you but you were you were in the booth when he was with the Pirates all those years. Yeah. You got any Jim Leland stories that you remember that were just, or what was it like, you know, being around him a lot at, when he was the manager of the, of the Pirates? Well, I... I loved him. Yeah, I'll tell you a story, and it had nothing to do with with the, the game. So I did a lot of charity work for for family hospice. Yeah. Okay. So uh, they they had this um, the organization, and um, and I I got to think of the lady now. I'll think of her next. But she had a, an event, and uh, she wanted it to revolve. You got to have heart. And remember the, the damn Yankees. There was a song. You got to oh, have yeah, heart. Yeah. So uh, I got. I got Nellie Bryles and Jim Leland and myself, and we put on pirate uniforms, and we went down, and we sang You Gotta Have Heart. <laughs> and and Leland, Leland bought a bat, and he could never hit. And he said, I can't have a bat, because I, I, I said, you know what? The internet hasn't buried us yet. You bring a bat, because you had a great career here. <laughs> Nellie bought a ball, and I bought a glove. And we got up there like three mental patients and sang You Gotta Have Heart. And worse than that, I went on KDK with John Cigna to yeah. promote it. And I started singing it. And you got to have heart. All you really need is heart. When you're thinking that you'll, you'll never win, that's when the Grinch should start. I went through, and it was all, Cygnus said, keep your day job. <laughs> and he made me say, you have to stop now. He said, you have to stop. <laughs> we but, don't want to hear anymore. But the great thing, oh, we, we did it for this charity. And uh, uh, yeah, it, was, it was so wonderful. And uh, uh, so he, he was willing to do that because he, he got it. You know? yeah, he, and... Uh, uh, you'll recognize this. You know Atreus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The original Atreus. On yes, Lim yes. I, I, real quick, I had a I had a friend of mine, T.J. McGarvey. I got him tickets oh, sure, to the. Sure. You know T.J. Yes, yeah. yeah. So I got tickets for T.J. to the World Series in 2006, and yep. you know T.J. is the greatest Vietnam vet. You yep. know, just one of the greatest human beings ever. Uh, he comes down to the uh, to the dugout, and I'm like, "Hey, Mr. McGarvey, did you get your tickets? Yeah, yeah." yeah. Then he just says, "Hey, Shawnee," turns to Leland, "Hey, Leland, the boys miss you down at Atrius, you know." And Leland pops out, "Hey, tell the guys I said hi," you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, we had we had a charity thing to do with our wives, uh, and so um, we stop at Atrius after, and it's and it's December, and he and I start singing Christmas carols. It was terrible. <laughs> Nobody ever got thrown out of Atreus. We did. They told us, you have to stop now. <laughs> and they, they were so nice about it. But, oh but they, they, they were serious. <laughs> serious as a heart attack. And well, Leland used to, he loves to sing and dance. Like, he, when, oh, after the game, he'd be oh. singing. But I don't know why he would sing this song, but remember the, uh, Toby Keith, you know, the uh, country music singer, he had a song called Who's Your Daddy? <laughs> Who's your daddy? Who's your baby? Who? And Leland would just... We'd be sitting there on the flight, and he'd be like, "Hey, Case, who's your daddy? Who's?" And he'd go into the whole song. It was unbelievable. Like it's the best. He and I tried to sing at a charity event out in Monroeville one night, trying to sing "Brown Eyed Girl" by Van Morris. <laughs> you my brown <laughs> back so of the stadium with you, my brown eyed girl. <laughs> so great. Now here's so great. here's the thing. We also went to a, a, a men's stag. Yeah. And uh, where you could really have fun. Yeah, where you could yeah. really have fun. <laughs> And he was kidding. They all they knew about. It. They asked him about you know the tough years when when he was here. He said, he said he had a friend that called me. He said, Jim, can you leave me tickets tonight? And Jim said, Sure. And the guy says, When's the game start? And Jim said, When can you get here? <laughs> and then he said, Where are the tickets going to be? He says, You you can sit on second base. We're not using it. <laughs> so, I mean, he always had the stories. And oh, oh my god, god he, he was so good. He was. I don't know anybody better with the media. Yeah. And and here here's a story too, symbolic. So we lose the crusher to the Braves in the playoff game. Sid Nine Dreams, two. Nine, yeah. oh. Dream slides across home plate. Still kills me as yeah. a fan. I, I'm down in the in the dugout because we're gonna win it. They got the plastic up to yeah. protect the lockers. They got the the t uh, the big TV on a, on a big platform. They got the champagne. I'm waiting to do an interview with Tim Wakefield. Yeah. They've got the the MVP. Uh, etched Tim Wakefield MVP oh, wow so I'm ready to go Bream slides across home plate they rip down the plastic TV camera goes away the champagne goes away uh, 
and they put tape over the, over the thing and put somebody else in, I don't know who it was, and it's devastating. I'm down there, and, and so no interview, and so I don't know what to do, so I wind up going in with the media to talk to Leland. Leland said, isn't this the kind of thing that makes baseball great? Wow. You talk about coming up so huge. Not da, 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 da. Didn't take the low road, took a high road. One of the best interviews I've ever seen or could imagine a manager doing when he's devastated. When he's devastated. They're going to go to the World Series. Yeah. And uh, wow. yeah, that, that was Jim Leland. He's just so so good with people. Yeah. Uh, and uh, every time I see him now, every time I see him now, we have to have a dirty joke. <laughs> you guys, uh, you guys have the best jokes, and it's unbelievable how you guys uh, never tell the same one. Oh my goodness! Yeah, and it's uh, can't tell any of them here, but I'm each after. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk. Yeah, you told plenty before. Before these guys came on, fans at home, they were telling jokes, and we it was pretty fun. Dirty jokes going. They were good too. Yeah, we, we we spent a half an hour before we started this. Where <laughs> if we had recorded that, we would be. Uh, we'd have to live in Spain. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> we would not have time. Tonight. <laughs> and it would, it would be, it'd be fe- several federal agencies <laughs> on the plane right behind us. Uh, Blast, before, we, before we, 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 use, we end this with a thing called 9090, but before we do that, can you, I, that Vic Davalillo story, you have to tell that story. Oh, Vic? Yes. Can, oh. Can, tell us who Vic Davalillo well, was. Vic, Vic Davalillo, we got him late in his career. He had a, if you trace his career, he had 325 for the Indians, stayed around 14 years, and we got him. He was on our World Series team. And so uh, Vic struggled uh, with hydration in Chicago. <laughs> if he, just saying. <laughs> uh, he's out on the street at 4 o'clock every afternoon in one of the great cities and, and so uh, Vic has a rough time with some bad ice or, or being overserved so he doesn't dare go to sleep um, and we got a game the next day so th- the bus is going to leave at nine o'clock Vic didn't dare go to sleep so he's waiting there and he gets on the bus at seven and the bus gets there at seven he's sitting back there in the bus by himself in the back buses the bus is there windows down and he's just on the gong show and uh, as he's as he's uh, sitting there the door to our hotel opens up and out comes harlan sanders colonel chicken the kentucky fried chicken and the colonel is decked out he's got the white suit he's got the string tie he's got the hat he's got the cane and look vic looks out the window at him and it's too much for vic doesn't know anything about who he is rolls down the window and says hey you and gives it gives it to the, the colonel the colonel looks back, drops the cane, takes his hat off. Me? Oh, yo! <laughs> I'm sitting in the front seat. I'm there early. I'd have bought a ticket for this thing. <laughs> oh you got Colonel Sanders giving it to this guy from Venezuela who've never seen each other <laughs> in their life. And it's just great theater. Great theater. It's so great. It's so great. Uh, oh, I, my I, God. It's one of the great moments, oh you know, in the top three moments I've Stuff ever had like in baseball. That, I know. So, yeah. Only if you're a big leaguer would you ever see that. You know, oh. the, 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 everything lining, aligning perfectly. If you so. could, if you could take a personnel check of every visiting player that's gone and played in Wrigley Field in the day game, <laughs> you could blow Bull Durham away. We have to find this stories. A, a that's seri- a book. That would be a series. Day yes. games at Wrigley, a whole book on it. Netflix. <laughs> it, would <laughs> bring, it would bring them back from yesterday's cry- crash. <laughs> <laughs> So great! Uh, it's it's unbelievable oh the, the Wrigley stories. I had a chance to sing "Take Me Out to the Ball Game" once with a hangover. <laughs> I'm sweating like a pig. It, it's 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 like I'm doing this thing in the Mississippi Delta, and I've got a shirt and tie on. I'm choking. Uh, I I'd been overserved the night before, so of course what they do they say here's Steve Blass, the world champion last year, Pittsburgh Pirates, to sing "Take Me Out to the Ball Game." 30,000 people booed the hell out of me right did they, there. Did they? Booing me. <laughs> like, like I didn't like my parents. Oh my like I was illegitimate or something. Oh so I, I won the day. I said, hello, I'm glad to be here. I'm singing this song in honor of my good friend and your her- hero, Ron Sando. They all start cheering. <laughs> you say Ron Sando, we love you. We I love had you. one sense of some sensibility left to me. <laughs> and that was my second best day. My worst was the day that Doc Ellis 
came out of the dugout with pink curlers in his hair. Why? Nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows. We were all done. You know how you are. You're feeling a little sluggish the day after a, right, a right, night in yeah. Chicago. So all his pitchers are hiding down in the dugout or the bullpen. Doc comes out with pink curlers with every media personality in Chicago trailing him. Doc, you can't do this to us. We're resting. And he <laughs> made them walk by us, and we're, we're no ball of fire either. <laughs> oh the only other story that I can tell about Doc is we're in Montreal, okay, with Danny Murtaugh, the manager. <clears throat> Danny calls a clubhouse meeting before the game, and, uh, and uh, the... Um, the starting rotation is not doing well. So right. that's why the meeting is called. And Danny says, well, he says, you know what's going to happen here? He says, if you starters don't get it together, somebody's going to go to the bullpen. And Doc stands up, well, who's going to be the one that's going to go to the bullpen? <laughs> he says, you know, Blast ain't going to the bullpen. You know Moose ain't going to the bullpen. You know Bryles ain't going to the bullpen. Then he stands up and he says, you know the doctor ain't going to the bullpen. <laughs> Mur Mur starts, Murtaugh starts laughing. That's the end of the meeting. Oh, my gosh. And I could say it in Doc's voice, but I can't say it in Doc's yeah, voice. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, right, so, right. Yeah, but well, anyway, he says, up, who's anything. going to be the one that's yeah. going? You know the doctor ain't going to the bullpen. <laughs> doctor ain't going to the bullpen. That's so great. Oh, that's oh, so, so great. So, so much, so much fun. Oh, so man. many memories. This is so great, man. We'll do chapter two of this. Well, we need to do it. I can literally <laughs> could be here for the next seven hours. We finish it up. Chinch does a thing. We have nine questions in, in uh, nine. We d it turns out to be two minutes, not really 90 seconds. We thought it was, but it's like, ah, geez, what a 90 90. So Chinch is going to ask a question, fun questions. He'll ask me, then I'll answer, then you go. Okay. <laughs> Hall of Fame baseball broadcaster Marty Brenneman here. It's time for 9 in 90, the most ridiculous segment in all of sports. This is, un this is unbelievable. This has been one of the greatest days of my career. Uh, you are the best. <laughs> I've been laughing and crying. Uh, this is such an honor. So thank you so much for doing this. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to embarrass myself by asking you nine really stupid questions. So, Sean, the first one. Would you rather take a sneak peek into your future or change one thing in your past? I'd rather uh, to take a sneak peek into my future because I feel like all the things that happened in your past are the reason you're at where you're at. So I'll just I'll look to the future. All right. I'd go. I'd like to go to the Peekaboo Lounge in Bradenton. <laughs> <laughs> that's just what I'm talking anyway, about. That's neither here nor there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and hey, we're off to a good start. Oh, well, let me, uh, yeah, just a quick answer. I, I, uh, I would, I would never like to change anything in my past because I had the greatest, and then I had the, the lowest part of, of of the mountain, and I learned from both. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. That's great. Did, blast on on that. What what did you learn from that lowest part? Like, what's the one? What are some of the things you learn that you you take from that? Well, you, that you don't quit, and that you get to know more about yourself. Uh, I always say that uh, you know the greatest thing you can have, motivational or awareness, costs thirty nine bucks at Home Depot, and that's your bathroom mirror. Because right. you might be able to fool everybody in a town or a city or an organization or friends or teammates or whatever, but you can't fool yourself, and that. That mirror is going to ask you questions you can only answer with your gut. So you learn about yourself, how you can handle it, that you don't change, that you're not bitter. Uh, it's a reality check. And I think you learn just as much when you go through that failure and survive it survive. and survive and it. And you keep going. And it doesn't change you as a person. I, I'm, I'm quite proud of that. It was the most horrible. I'm, I mean, I wound up in the back backyard in Upper St. Clair four o'clock in the morning, tears running down my face because I wasn't going to be a pirate anymore. Wow. So you learn from that stuff. You learn who your friends are. You learn who you are, your family. So, yeah, you learn a lot. You know, when, wow. you're, when you're winning, you're, you're on a crest. You're on a wave. You're surfing. Right. Uh, but, boy, you, you, you've got to get real with yourself. And so it makes, I, you know, the old cliche, if it doesn't destroy you, it makes you stronger. Yeah. Wow, man, that's awesome. That is awesome. Wow, perfect follow-up to that uh, case. Would you rather have non-stop hip non hiccups or non-stop sneezing? I can't believe that's what I just followed, that brilliant answer. <laughs> I know, the best answer of the show, <laughs> we were asking about hiccups and sneezing. <laughs> I would say the worst thing I hate in my life is the hiccups. Uh -huh. I just, uh, it's it's absolutely, so I, I don't want non-stop hiccups. I'd have to be good. I'd jump off a building, I think. Sneezing is fun. It feels great. Yeah, it does feel good, right? But I agree. Half the time when you're hiccuping, you're going to puke. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, a good sneeze, but I've, I've, 
I've heard horror stories about people who can't stop sneezing oh, because yeah. everything else lets loose too. <laughs> yeah. Sneezing is a one part aspect of that whole program. <laughs> I can tell true. you, not from experience, I read about yeah, I it. Got <laughs> All right, Case, would you rather have a car that can fly or a car that can go underwater? Uh, I, I want to fly, so I don't have a car that can fly. They can guarantee me that I'm all good up there. I want to have a cane. Both of those things are going to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Don't go on roller coasters or anything like that. All right, Case, would you rather have one month with no communication with your friends or one month with no internet access? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'd definitely rather have one month with no internet. Right. Yeah, that's, that, that's a lock. I mean, we're in that world now, but... Mm. Yeah. Hard to, it's hard to be hard to go through life with just an internet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Put a little human interaction. <laughs> yeah, <you know>. some buddies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's tough. And that, that goes into a whole that, that goes down a <laughs> twisty turning highway. <laughs> it certainly does. All right, this is a good All one. All right, have a bottle in front of me or a frontal lobotomy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take the bottle in front of me. There, there you go. Just Sam. <laughs> Perfect. All right, Case, would you rather have a personal maid or a personal chef? Oh, personal chef, personal chef. I think Blast needs a maid. <laughs> no, no, I've been married 58 years. <laughs> this little Boy Scout ain't saying nothing. <laughs> you're breaking up. You're breaking, you're breaking up. up. So, <laughs> all right, next one, Sean. What was your, yeah. you got to pick one of these. You can only have one nipple or you have two belly buttons and you have to choose one. Uh, I rather, I rather have t uh, two belly buttons. Okay. I don't know why. This is a ridiculous <laughs> yeah, question. Well, You're asking, but I have, I have, I don't, I don't even know what Blast's gonna say. <laughs> well, I have no idea. I just want to. Keep, <laughs> I want to take. I want to go sideways. Make sure the crank's all right. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> okay. Oh my gosh. Wait. Okay. Next question. I got a preface. You're an actor. You were in a movie. Is that correct? You acted, Blast. Yeah. What? I get nine dollars from. Screen Actors Guild every year. <laughs> Wait, I but, a bit part in a movie called Abduction. Yes, which, and for everybody, including Sean, let me just rip Taylor Lautner's in there. Your daughters will know who that is, Case, Twilight oh. Kid. You're talking Lily Collins has been in everything. Alfred Molina, Doc Octopus, who's a brilliant actor, and it was directed never by had John. Never had as good as yours, What's it? Oh, <laughs> never had again. It's good. <laughs> Directed by John Singleton, Boys in the Hood, Sean. What'd you do? Oh, I was a, I was a, a baseball commentator. Uh, you can you can barely hear me. <laughs> oh, really? For four seconds. But the great thing is, I'm at the top of credits because it's alphabetical. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> I said but to Sean before, I, I get nine dollars every year, <laughs> and I can't wait to cash a check. Oh. I played before free agency. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So this is a good question, Sean. You answer it first. Better actor, Pacino or De Niro? Oh man, I'm a I'm a De Niro guy. I love Pacino, but I'm a De Niro guy. I'd say yes. I mean, they're, yeah, yeah, they're, yeah, that's they're, a yes. They're yeah, they're fabulous. Tough. And uh, what was it? They were in a movie together once. It was oh, 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 a heat, in, heat. Yeah, yeah. No, he but that wasn't well, yeah, the Godfather. Was Pacino, oh, Pacino wasn't in Goodfellas, was he? Yeah, no. yeah, yeah. Mm, no, Pacino wasn't in Goodfellas. You're talking about Chanchamino here. Oh, no, what about Godfather? Godfather, Godfather two. Yeah. They were in together, but I don't I actually don't think they actually had a scene together. Well, well, who gives there a you shit? go. <laughs> who gives a shit? Is right. <laughs> Moving on. Hey, uh, yeah. All right, more fun. You know, uh, <laughs> okay. Doris Day too. Don't ever forget Doris Day. Doris Day. Oh yeah. yeah. There you go. <laughs> when I was Blast, Blast, yeah. who's the greatest? Uh, who's the greatest uh, like celebrity you've you've met in this whole realm? Mm. Celebrity you've ever met? I was in the Oval uh, Office with President Nixon after Clemente died. What? Oh. Yeah. Her, we were there supposed to be. You know, it's all scheduled. Eight, we're supposed to have eight minutes, and and we were in there nineteen minutes. I mean, I don't know how he's prepped or what that was, but he wanted to see us because he wanted to do something for Clemente's Pirate City. Uh, from HUD, H-U-D, and also from he and Pat. Uh, they wanted to do something personally because of Clemente's uh, Pirate City that was a great concept. It, it never ran its course. But uh, we were we were in a White House contact uh, from the airplane before it landed, and then we were in, uh, we were in a, like a presidential limousine. I don't know if that had camouflage on it or not, <laughs> but it was, it was uh, Dave Justy, myself, and Dan Galbraith, and uh, it was just... Uh, what, what, what was Nixon like? Couldn't have been nicer. Couldn't have been nice. But I still think 
The 23 missing minutes from the uh, secretary was us. <laughs> <laughs> I still got, I got a good That's feeling about that. <laughs> so, yeah, we, we yucked it up a little bit. <laughs> wow. Jeez, so oh. good. All right, last question. We need, first of all, you need a movie about yourself. Last question. This is fun. Would you rather be popular but ugly, Sean, or unknown but attractive? Uh, at this stage of my life, unknown and attractive. <laughs> I don't have much choice. <laughs> Manny Sanguin used to call me fail, which is ugly. Fail for Spanish for ugly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I always wondered when you, when I, I, I took him Long Giant Silver. <laughs> <laughs> When I was in high, in school I, and you would get the Spanish book, I always wondered, they took a picture of a girl or a boy and that picture, it would say feo underneath it. And I'm like, if this person ever knew that they were the definition of ugly in my Spanish book, I would know. <laughs> How does that? Well, let me tell you a story because uh, we'll wind up having a, a, a bobblehead with Manny Sanguin and they have to get your authorization of the pose and everything. <laughs> So they called me and I said, uh, what's this all about? They said, well, we're going to put you on a bobblehead with Sangi. And I, they said, uh, we, you know, we have to have confirmation that your likeness is okay. I said, huh, go for it. I'm going to be fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, so that's the case. That was he nice. says the same thing about me, by the way. <laughs> you know, he calls me Loquito, <laughs> which is in, insane person. <laughs> Blast, man. This has been unbelievable. I honestly feel like we need to do a, a Steve Blast part two. So would you be up for that if we call you down the road? I don't know if you know how to get to my house because it took you like like three hours. Yeah, right through house. Lincoln, Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> it, it didn't worry. It wasn't a problem because I couldn't have driven from Lincoln. <laughs> it took so much time for us to get down there. <laughs> It's true. it's true. My computer crashed. Frank could get the mics right. That was part because I walked in. I have that effect. I I, I What's going on with the computer? Yeah, I touched my wife, Karen's computer in the garage door when I'm the other side. <laughs> oh, my gosh, bro. Blast. Thank you, man. You are the greatest. I love you, brother. I love you. And I'm so thankful to do this, man. Chinch, I told you, bro. You can what did I say? Uh, we you said blast in here. We probably yeah. be here for six hours with some of the best stories ever. So one of my favorite days ever. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you coming. Seriously. <laughs> great, great show. Appreciate everyone that's listening out. Listen. I love you, man. <laughs> <laughs> I love blast. I love you too. Yeah. Don't ever leave. Don't ever leave. Don't ever leave. <laughs> that's our send off. Steve it. Blast loves us. We love everybody out there. We'll see you next week. See ya. <laughs>